Within minutes of Philip Hammond's budget announcement that he was putting up national insurance contributions for the self-employed, there was outrage, much of it from his own party's backbenchers, amid accusations a manifesto pledge had been broken. Today, exactly a week on, the Chancellor backed down, although he still maintained that the commitment applied only to Class 1 contributions and not the Class 4s paid by the self-employed. It is very important, both to me and to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, that we comply not just with the letter, but also the spirit of the commitments that were made. Therefore, as I set out in my letter this morning to the Chairman of the Select Committee, my right honourable friend, the member for Chichester, I have decided not to proceed with the Class 4 NICS measures set out in the Budget. There will be no increases in national insurance contribution rates in this Parliament. And I will set out in the autumn budget further measures to fund in full today's decision. Oh, Chris Bryce is Chief Executive of the Association of Independent Professionals and the Self-Employed. And Torsten Bell is in our Westminster studio. He's the director of the Resolution Foundation, which campaigns to improve the living standards of those on low to middle incomes. And he called for a rise in the national insurance contributions paid by the self-employed. Well, Chris, let me start with you. This move, this climb down, is going to leave a, a black hole in the budget of around a billion pounds. How do you propose the Chancellor fills it? Well, I, I'm quite happy to sit with uh, the Chancellor and uh, go through the, the issue with him. But I, one, one area you could take a look at is the lack of national employers' national insurance contributions made for part-time workers. I, I, I'm pretty sure we could fill the hole quite quickly if we looked at that. That would uh, still be a tax on jobs, of course. Uh, well, national insurance is the, the tax on jobs, and, but the real issue is, in fact, the way that we work in a 21st century economy, and in fact, a, a drains up review of the entire taxation system is what's really required. We have a 19th century tax system, 21st century economy, the two just don't mix. Now, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which of course is, uh, you know, revered on the, all issues to do with tax, they thought this was actually quite a sensible move, and also a progressive move. I mean, this is basically a bung to the uh, better off, him backing down like this. Isn't it? Well, no, it, it, that's not ex exactly correct. I mean, th this tax cuts in around £16,000. So somebody li earning below the living wage could, in fact, have more tax applied to them. Well, except that the Chancellor is abolishing Class 2 NICs, so it, it still uh, leaves lower-paid self-employed people it, better off. It, it leaves those uh, up to about £16,000 slightly better off. £8,000 is, is the, the, the ideal, if you like. But, in fact, anybody above £16,000 would, would have been paying more tax. But the fact remains, you now have, in a lot of cases, people in the city, well-paid IT professionals, for example, doing exactly the same job as salaried employees and paying a fraction of the tax that they do. Well, that's a slightly different case because they're generally working through limited companies rather than paying sole proprietor or sole trader national insurance. But taking your point, uh, those people have op opted to work uh, in a flexible way to provide their services in a flexible way to clients who want them to work flexibly. And they've taken up huge risk upon themselves. So I, I think a, a, a tax differential is justified and fair. Well, Torsten Bell, let me uh, bring you in at this point. Torsten, so Torsten, uh, the, you would argue, presumably, this is not a very good thing because uh, you thought it was quite a progressive measure, didn't you? Well, look, this is a, it's a slightly odd U-turn from the Chancellor today because he's both said that the policy is totally the right thing to do and also he's not going to go ahead with it. So that, and that is not normally what you get in uh, U-turns. And the reason he's done that is because obviously the politics of this is difficult. The politics of all tax rises are difficult. Nobody wants money taken out of their pocket and politicians don't like taking it in general. So the politics is difficult. That's compounded by a thing called a manifesto, which I'll leave others to uh, judge how difficult that makes it. But on the substance, the Chancellor is absolutely right. And he's right because the gap in tax paid by the self-employed compared to employees is big and actually is now growing because of uh, what you mentioned earlier, the abolition of Class 2 national insurance. But the gap between what the self-employed get out from the system compared to employees is shrinking at the same time because the self-employed will now get the same state pension as employees for the first time. And that was the big gap between the two groups of people and what justified the difference in, in tax. So the Chancellor was right to look at closing that gap. The, um, as I say, the politics haven't worked out for him. As you say, the uh, justification the Chancellor used was that now we've got a flat rate pension system, effectively the self-employed are making the same demands on the status as the employed. Is there a case, given that he's wound back on that, to say, well, self-employed people shouldn't get as generous a state pension as uh, employed people? 
Well, I, mean, I wouldn't say that. I mean, it's very important that we have a broad and uh, level base for pension saving. It encourages other people to save on their own behalf. And there was a problem with the self-employed not having enough pension savings in the past. So no, I don't think that's the answer to the question. The answer to the question is a fairer tax system that catches up, as your um, other guest was saying, with the, well, the way the world of work has changed. 45% of the growth in self-employment in recent years, sorry, in employment in recent years, has been amongst the self-employed. They've been driving it. The, um, uh, and in that world, it's a big risk both to the fairness between the self-employed and the employees, but also to the public finances to have this large gap. Look, for some of the people you're talking about just now, an IT worker sitting next in a firm um, an expensive IT worker, admittedly, but in a firm, if that person is an employee costing the firm £100,000, they are paying £7,000 a year more into the exchequer than the same person employed on a self-employed basis. You might think, you may well think that some gap is justified, but it definitely can't be justified on that scale. That is a real issue, Chris, isn't it? Well, I, I actually think Torsen's uh, incorrect on this. I think it can be justified because that self-employed worker is responsible for in, in its entirety, the employee benefits uh, that the, the employee he's working next to gets from the company. For example, training, pension contributions, uh, sickness pay, even holiday pay. If you're self-employed, you are on your own. And you know, whilst the state pension may be there for you at the end of the day, uh, your contributory pension uh, which uh, auto-enrolment captures for the employees just doesn't exist. But ultimately the point is that self-employed people make exactly the same uh, demands of the state as employed people. Why should they pay less taxes? Well, in fact, I, I think that's incorrect. I mean, the evidence that we have shows that self-employed people take less sick days, that they, they rarely uh, sign on for, for job seekers allowance in between uh, contracts. Um, the, it, our evidence is just the opposite. In fact, the self-employed work harder take the burden upon themselves and, uh, in fact, in general, perform better than, in some cases, they would have done had they been employed. Torsten, is there a case for saying that national insurance contributions should just be abolished and we should just merge them with income tax? Would that be a more sensible measure in this day and age? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tax that's outlived its usefulness in many ways, isn't it? Well, let me, let me come back to that. But just on the point um, your guest was just making, I think we should be really careful here about, look, we want lots of people to have the choice to be self-employed. We want them to choose to be their own boss. For some of them, a small percentage, but for some of them that are setting up their own company, employing other people, that's a good thing and we want to encourage that. But that is not the majority of people who are self-employed. Only 11% of the self-employed actually employ other people. And in particular, we, I think we should be really careful about kind of saying, you know, employees who remember make up 85% of our workforce are in somehow not wealth creators, not working hard, not taking any risks. I mean, you go and say that to somebody on low pay on a zero hours contract, and I don't think they'll take you seriously. So I think we should, let's be careful. We want to support the self-employed. I'm in favour of that. I'm in favour of greater protection for right. their pension save. But, but that does not mean that everybody else is somehow a kind of skyver that's living off the state.